Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you very much for uh, being here uh, today. Um, the Sociology Club uh, uh, welcome you to this uh, great uh, event. Uh, today we have uh, um, Christina Tab, which will um, ask a question to our dear colleague and dear friend, uh, um, Dr. Sarah Beden. And I apologize, uh, I'm sure I mispronounced your Bidus. Bidus. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, so today we will have a, a, a great uh, a discussion, and I would like to encourage uh, all of you to um, think about uh, uh, majoring in uh, anthropology and also to start uh, an anthropology uh, club. Um, your uh, professor uh, are here to help you succeed at Eastern and to uh, start uh, your own uh, undergrad uh, research. So it's for this reason um, we, uh, we organize this, this, this session to encourage you to start your own uh, research. And um, uh, we hope that this kind of talk uh, will uh, really push you to research what really interests uh, you. Well, enjoy this great uh, conversation. Have a great afternoon with us. Thank you. All right. Thank you to everybody who came. Um, we're going to be discussing Dr. Barres's book. So I guess I'll just start off with questions. Okay. What's it called? Oh Land of Water, City of the Dead. Thank you. Religion and Cahokia's Emergence. Yes. Excuse my voice, too. I'm struggling with a cold, so we'll see how long this lasts before I lose it. I'm just going to go for as long as we can. <laughs> so for the first question, for those who have not had the pleasure of reading your book, could you give a brief overview of where and what Cahokia is and what initially inspired you to conduct research there? Yeah, so I'm an archaeologist, and so my research focuses on Native American pre-European contact history at the Native American city of Cahokia, which is located in um, or near modern-day St. Louis, Missouri. Um, my research is particularly focused on urbanization, so questions around how and when did people start building urban environments and creating urban landscapes. And so my particular focus on Native American cities tries to kind of broaden our understanding of when and how people um, across the globe started this process. Uh, and I think it's important for us to focus on Native American history because it's often um, a part of our global history that's overlooked. And so by focusing on understanding Cahokia um, as its own city, uh, we start to see that indigenous peoples in the Americas are doing the same things that societies uh, in Western Europe and in Asia are doing. Uh, so trying to understand this sort of broader phenomenon of why we as human beings like to live in urban landscapes and why we build places like New York City or like Chicago or like Los Angeles and what brings us to those spaces. So this book is exploring that question on a broad scale, but also looking at the reasons behind what drew um, tens of thousands of Native peoples to Cahokia and to build this place and create this urban landscape. So that's it in a nutshell. So sort of along that theme, Emergence is referenced on the cover of your book. Can you give an overview of how Camo like Cahokia emerged? <clears throat> yeah, so Cahokia um, shows up on the landscape at AD, about AD 1000. So if we think about it in terms of the histories that we're familiar with, um, this is about the same time that we see medieval London and medieval Paris sort of blossoming. So at the same time that this is going on, you have Cahokia showing up as well. So we're talking about, about a 400 year period from about AD 1000 to 1400. And um, this particular city basically shows up very quickly. Uh, it was a rapid construction with thousands of people moving into this region at about AD 1000, um, bringing with them new ways of life. They started intensive corn agriculture, which is a very important uh, transformation to the ways that people are living because it started to say that you could now become sedentary. You can stay in one place. It provided the foundation for people to build um, a city landscape. So being able to form farm corn in surplus <coughs> um, allowed for lots of people to move into a region, set up their neighborhoods, set up their um, 
housing set up, uh, trade networks, all these kinds of things, and uh, exist in this landscape. So what else was happening here too was a, really a political and a religious uh, transformation as well that required um, new leadership that was based in a broader religious understanding of uh, the community. So it ties in burial practice and um, an understanding of the cosmos or the celestial bodies, so like the sun and the movements of the moon and um, how these sort of played out in the broader landscape. I'm trying to think, uh, I think that's a good summary. Yeah, I think that was too. Focusing on like the religious concept, um, the concept of animism is discussed throughout your work. Why is the focus of on animism important to you, especially in the context of this research? Yeah, so um, oftentimes when you learn about Native American studies, you learn about Native American peoples as being these really religious peoples, and they're down to earth. It might be a stereotype you're familiar with, or that they um, have these like uh, spirit connections, and people often talk about spirit animals and these things that are very sort of stereotypical when we think of Native American experience. Uh, animism is a concept that is sort of emerged from this idea or was the predecessor to these stereotypes um, that's really based in a way of a new ontological way of thinking about the world, uh, which means that indigenous peoples, yes, have deep connections to the landscape, um, but they're not superficial. They are about how they construct their entire understanding of the world around them as tied to the importance of the earth and um, the community of peoples that they live with and amongst. And so animism asks that we understand this as a way of life that is not separated from everyday experience. And it tells us that we have to recognize that animism is um, something that is a religious point of view, but also a political aspect and also part of your daily life. So you have all of these things wrapped up together in how indigenous people relate to the world around them that um, creates their ontology or the way that they experience the world and the way that they view their, their world. Uh, and when we think about how we analyze the Native American past, we have to understand this as a central focus um, of our research in order to be uh, do the best job that we can to try to understand their lived experience. Um, so animism is an Im important aspect of understanding this past life, these past life ways, and it's central to to the book and how I sort of frame um, the ways that Native Cahokians constructed their urban landscape. And I apologize, my voice is starting to fade. Oh, no. um, but we'll keep going. Okay, until you can't go yeah. anymore. Okay. Um, you touched a little bit on like the stereotypes. So this question is do you feel that animism is misunderstood or dismissed by Western researchers? And if so, how might this impact the people they are studying? Oh yeah, for sure. I think that um, colonialism and the colonial encounter between native peoples in the West uh, really started to start about start creating these stereotypes about what we think of as a Native American way of life and a Native American life way. Um, and this sort of colonial presentation really limited how we can or how people viewed the Native American experience and sort of put it into two boxes. One, that you are connected to the earth and that's vitally important, which um, is, but it's also sort of limiting in its nature and how that's presented. And two, that uh, Native people weren't capable of sort of moving beyond this, this belief system. And if we incorporate those stereotypes into our contemporary research, it really limits our perspective of um, the indigenous lived experience. And uh, what this does is it paints a one-dimensional view of indigenous people, which is very problematic because we need to recognize that they have multi-dimensional lives and that all native people are not the same too. So we have to take that into consideration, which is very important when we're doing our research. And if you really take the time to examine an animistic perspective and communicate with n contemporary native populations, um, you can quickly realize that this perspective is very diverse depending on the region that you're working in or the community that you're talking to and that um, in order to do a good sort of scholarly investigation, you have to 
be aware of this diversity and incorporate it into your research. So I think if we dismiss animism or talk about it as a sort of stereotype, um, we really limit our ability to fully respect and understand the Native American experience. Excuse me. You okay? Yeah, I'm okay. good. Okay, good. Um, Animism appeared to be particularly important to the burial practices of the Cahokian people and their overall relationship with the surrounding landscape that they inhabited. How did your taking animism into account inform your interpretation of what you saw and uncovered? Yeah, so a big part of this project was also looking at mortuary practice, um, so burial practices. <clears throat> and uh, the particular mounds that these individuals were buried in and a lot of this research was done in the 1960s, the excavations. So this book project basically went back to all those previous excavations and attempted to um, examine them for similarities of practice and to understand how burial practice played a role in this city's layout. And so if we think about our modern cities, um, you probably all live in a community with a cemetery. You probably all know where that cemetery is. Um, you may or may not have family buried there, but nonetheless, it's an important part of the landscape. So the same thing is happening at Cahokia, where you have these cemetery spaces that are pivotal points on the landscape. And they all have hundreds and hundreds of people buried in them in various states of uh, burial. So they're, some are disarticulated, meaning their body pieces of their body are uh, separated and um, buried uh, together, so you don't have articulated bodies, but you have bundles of arm bones and bundles of legs and crania um, buried separately. And they're also included with thousands of artifacts, marine shell beads, pottery, projectile points, exotic material that comes from thousands of miles away. Uh, the Rocky Mountains, for example, um, or excuse me, the uh, shell from the Gulf Coast. So when we're thinking about um, these materials and the presence of the bodies, you have to start trying to understand why they're putting these things together and how they're doing this. Um, so thinking about an animistic perspective allows you to try to unpack these relationships to determine what the importance of the shell beads were or what the importance of the pottery was to the burial of the dead and why these things are related on this landscape. Uh, so that became an important question of this research. Why do you see these things buried the way that they are? And um, what's those connections say about that community's culture and values? I think that ties right into the next thing I was gonna ask you is the bundles that you had come across while you were working and that you found that had been buried uh, they were that you said they were comprised of various bones belonging to numerous individuals. What did these bundles signify to you, and what did you interpret their meaning to be in the context of the religion and worldview of the Cahokian peoples? Yeah, the bundle burials are what they just sound like. So it's like long bones, your arms, your legs disarticulated from the axial skeleton, so your um, spinal column uh, uh, and, and your central body mass, and they're buried together, usually with crania. And these bundles suggest that people are burying their dead for short periods of time, exhuming the remains and then processing the bodies to bury them collectively together all at once in one episode. So that suggests that lots of people are coming from disparate regions, bringing their dead with them along with associated materials to bury them together. This is a communal practice. This is not like how we bury our dead today where we do it isolated with just family involved, but you have potentially hundreds of people, family members, coming together with their dead to bury them in one place at one moment in time. So <clears throat> this suggests that burial practice and human remains are thought of not only as the individual itself, but representations of community relationships and that they are important um, not in just individual identity, but in how they uh, provide insight into those relationships between family members. And they, the bodies kind of begin to stand for more than just the individual buried um, and focus on relationships uh, between communities of people. So if you think about it, you might be caring for, for the bones of your ancestor for a decade or more before you rebury them with um, hundreds of other people from the same community. So that's an important thing to think about. 
And these things, when we think about the meaning, um, when they're placed together on the landscape, they become markers in a way, markers of um, identity that's shared, markers of a particular event, and markers of uh, importance that signify uh, connections between the living world and the world of the dead. So if we go through and see these places of burial, they become a place where you can access uh, your ancestors and you can become part of that community. It's sort of like a liminal space that bridges the, the realm of the living and the realm of the dead. And that's kind of one of the ways that we have to look about these bundles. It's, uh, it's more than just processing bodies, but it's how they, they speak to these broader uh, relationships and networks that bridge this boundary between the way that we live today and the, or the way that the people were living to that, in that moment and then also their, their ancestors. Yeah, and you were talking about the disarticulation, and that was one part that I found particularly interesting in your book, is when you were discussing the perimortem and postmortem manipulation of the bodies prior to burial. What story did this physical trauma tell you in the context of the Cahokian worldview, and how did this encounter shape your understanding of the Cahokian belief system or systems? Yeah, so when you start looking at the way that these bodies are processed, um, if you come at it, your first experience is one that's kind of shock, because the bodies are taken apart using knives. They're disarticulated. Um, some individuals are sacrificed prior to burial. And so when you see this sort of these sort of acts, your first inclination is to think that this is violence. Um, it's a violent event. And it's one that might be really difficult to for us to process because we don't participate anymore in human sacrifice and we don't disarticulate human remains prior to burial in our uh, modern Western context. But when we look at the Cahokian experience, it's not something that should be couched in the sense of like a violent interaction, but rather one that's part of a broader worldview that ties us back to this understanding of how humans or what role humans play in um, their particular world experience. And so I have colleagues who've looked at this extensively in addition to myself and um, other archeologists think about these moments of sacrifice as moments where people are um, perhaps not willingly, but uh, active participants in these moments where they become, they're participating because they're being brought into an understanding of a creation story or um, a particular myth that might be about how, uh, you know, uh, corn uh, grows and what we need to produce a successful corn crop. So these events are not necessarily things that are worked through as a violent encounter, but one that might tie people back into these histories that create their, their human experience. And the body processing is a way for people to um, deal with the dead that tra might transform them into their ancestors. So through disarticulating human remains, you end up with... Um, body parts and pieces of people that create ancestors and create these connections to your, um, to the past and to the dead uh, that you wouldn't get otherwise with an individual burial. And so when you look at these things, you kind of have to remove yourself from, um, uh, uh, take a step back when you see, when you're examining how people process bodies, because globally throughout time, human beings have, disarticulated human remains, they bury them in different ways, they revisit them, they take skulls out, they carry them with them, they, these things happen. And so we just have to kind of re shift our focus on how we engage with the body and how we um, uh, navigate this, this process of, of uh, disarticulation and, and what it means to the community. So we have to kind of shift our focus away from it as being a violent act and one that might even be thought of as reverent um, and important to uh, those bodies and those persons being able to move into the afterlife. And you're talking about looking at this and seeing it as sort of like a violent act. This may answer this question right here, but how, how might Western thought interpret or misinterpret the manipulation of and the trauma to the bodies? Um, how do you feel that the Western, like Western biases get in the way when you're analyzing these phenomena? Yeah. So, um, Similar to what I was just saying, I think a lot of uh, these perspectives do come from colonialism, and uh, the there are case studies in what is now uh, Eastern Canada and upstate New York where 
uh, missionaries and other uh, people who are coming into encounter with Native Americans and a practice of ossuary burial, where the uh, people are coming together, oh, every decade or so, Native Americans are coming together to bury their disarticulated dead. This was often thought of as like a really gruesome experience. And so when we have those narratives being brought to us in our history books and the ways that we uh, learn about Native American experience, it does kind of cloud our interpretation. Um, and I think that those things are important to critique using um, contemporary conversations with Native peoples and thinking about their own sort of experience and understanding of these practices and what the reasons behind them might be. So when we examine these things for, as a Westerner, we have to recognize where our information is coming from and also be able to compare that to uh, contemporary populations and how they frame their own understanding of these events. So whenever I do this research, I can't just sort of put forward my own personal experiences, my own personal perspectives. I have to couch it within a broader context of uh, research that you know is conducted with the consideration of indigenous voices. Um, and that's one way that we can kind of work to shift these, these ideas and perspectives away from uh, potential bias uh, in our research. Uh, besides, you know, aside from the narratives that can get in the way, how can the modern world complicate archaeological research? And can the modern world be a hindrance to the analysis of places such as Cahokia? And how are you able to reconcile the intersection of both the past and the present? This is a really interesting question and one that I've been thinking about a lot lately. Um, so Cahokia Mounds is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So it's a globally recognized site. It's got protections by the state of Illinois and also um, these global protections from UNESCO. And it's currently being petitioned to become a, a state a, a national park. So when you go to Cahokia, it's this archeological site that's situated within a really urban population, a really poor urban population. And it's an urban population that's predominantly people of color. And this landscape, you go there and you can, you drive through this urban, modern urban landscape, and then you hit sort of like a wall, and then you enter into the Cahokia protected site. And then when you leave it, you go through this other sort of like portal almost, and you enter back into this urban landscape. And so when you do archeology span there, you have lots of things that you have to consider. One, it's not only how to preserve and protect the natural or the archeological resources, but also how to do that while thinking about the community, the contemporary community, and how your research might impact the contemporary community who um, are largely, as I mentioned, people of color and a lot of uh, um, migrant farm workers who come there throughout the year because Illinois is a great place to farm corn and soybeans, so there's lots of work in the region. It's a great fertile landscape, which is also why Cahokia is there, because it's uh, in the floodplain of the Mississippi River. So you have this really rich soil. So there's lots of farming that goes on even today. Um, and so as this place starting to become a state park, you have to think about the impact that that might have to the community living in the region. And so how you as an archaeologist conducts your research, you have to consider what goals of your pro what the goals of your project are and how that's going to uh, either conflict with the local community or potentially help them. Um, and so being an archaeologist requires not only that we think about the past, but that we also think about the present and the contemporary. And this introduction of a state park potentially has real implications for that community, those communities and how they g exist and um, live on the landscape, depending on where the national park boundaries are going to be drawn and um, whether or not they're going to incorporate the contemporary community and the urban landscape, or um, even the possibility of new businesses coming into the region and how that might impact them, and also how archaeology is going to contribute to that as well, because our research is going to draw thousands of people, it already does, to this region um, yearly. So it's you know there's real potential for a great economic boom, but also potentially an erasure of uh, the people who live there currently. And uh, we have to be very careful how we navigate those those issues. So we not only have that, but also just modern development in general, actively destroying archaeological sites, which is nothing unique to Cahokia, but happens across the United States. So we have to also be aware of that and consider how um, our research is not only for research's sake, but also salvage in a way, um, 
trying to protect these limited resources that we do have in the most productive way possible. So the modern world is both a hindrance and a, a great benefit to how we do our research. Um, we just have to consider all these different aspects when we do uh, our studies. And along those lines, throughout your book, your perspective was very nuanced and it felt very respectful of the Cahokian people and of the people in the community surrounding it. So what advice would you give future archeologists or anthropologists when conducting similar researches, research in spaces such as these? Yeah, I think for one, you just really have to focus on um, not only your own research goals, but also how that benefits the contemporary world. So we don't ever do our research in a vacuum, right? And that can apply broadly to anything beyond archeology span and anthropology, but we have to un sort of think about how our research questions are gonna impact us today. So my question broadly about urbanization and how people move into the landscape um, and how it changes uh, political relationships and how it transforms communities, that's applicable today too, as we have more and more people, um, you know, leaving different areas due to climate change or um, issues of migration, we have to consider how these influx of new people is going to impact our cultural understanding and um, the creation of communities. And so that's one thing that I would really say to anybody who's gonna start doing research and start thinking about how your research is gonna, um, what kinds of research questions you're gonna ask and, and what, if, what interests you, but it's not only about you, right? But it's also about how that impacts the contemporary world and your social, the social complex you live in, uh, that's really important. And one thing that archeology span is uniquely situated to, to help us understand is how human beings are resilient and um, how in the face of drastic change like climate change and massive migrations, we persevere and create new communities and transform our understandings and relationships uh, even in the face of real real crisis. So that's one thing that archeology span can and do and does very well is shed light on that and help us understand good ways to move uh, forward into uh, the future. And I think I'm gonna uh, lose my voice here. I was gonna say, completely. So. yeah, it sounds like you're fading. Well, I appreciate your time. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And anyone who hasn't had a chance to read the book, I highly suggest it, especially if you have an interest in anthropology and archaeology. It's a very rich narrative about Cahokia and just these practices. So pick it's it up. It's real great. It is real great. Just pick it up in the bookstore. I highly recommend it. So right. thank, thank you guys you. for coming. I appreciate it. Thanks, Chris. Thank you.